Let's let's kick off with the opening intro, the the, the grand uh, opening of our Foundation Study of Cycles Science Summit for 2022. A big welcome to all of our attendees and new members that have come on board with the FSC Science Summit uh, for this year. Uh, just to remind, it is a record attendance, so it's a great thing to celebrate in terms of the number of attendees, but also increase in new members. It's, it's great to see uh, the interest in cycles, but then also the commitment uh, to attend this event and to uh, follow on um, as members. Now, just a, a, an, an, an intro to the speakers that you will hear from today. Uh, I'll give a headline intro on, on the two speakers and then a deep dive on our guest speaker, but, uh, and then um, hand over to um, our head of science and, and nature, uh, Ray, uh, to share a few words. Um, about the foundation and, and, and his vision um, in this space. So our first speaker will be David Murren, focusing on breaking the code of war. And second speaker to follow, David Katzmeyer. You would have heard him, heard him uh, last year. Um, and, and this year we'll be speaking about American cycles, the crisis of 2027. Uh, I will pause there for now, uh, just to give a, a warm welcome to Ray uh, to share his words on behalf of the foundation. Ray, over to you. Thank you, Ron. Welcome everybody to this um, science summit, Cycles. Um, we had one last year and we hope to have many more. Um, the Foundation for the Study of Cycles is, is alive and well, but we did have a um, period where it was um, not so alive. So it's good, really good for it to be back to that. We do have a, a lot of um, people that have joined in on the trading side of things, the markets, uh, and that one's been very healthy for some years. But it's only over the last year or so that we've been building up the science side again, and we do need more um, scientists uh, from universities and elsewhere um, to join to, or rejoin and to get things working um, in a healthy way again. Um, so we've got a variety of, of subjects today, which um, Ron will be introducing the speakers. Um, I'll be speaking myself on the second day uh, of, the, of the conference. And it is um, really some breaking news that I'll be giving on um, a discovery that's been made regarding the sun and the effect on humans. So um, that's it. Let, I'll hand you back to Ron to, um, to introduce the speakers. Thank you very much, Ray. Look forward to... Uh... Uh, following up with your presentation on day two. And so just to uh, further clarify what Ray just said in terms of our day two as a preview. So our um, head of uh, science and nature, uh, Ray Terms will be talking about the 207 year uh, solar cycle and its implications. Uh, I'll be following up with an educational uh, take on the history of cycles and key influencers. I will try and touch on sunspot cycles, which is a, a personal favor of mine and how they connect the markets. And then we will complete the grand two day um, event uh, with a fireside chat with our chairman, Dr. Richard Smith, um, and cover a range of exciting news that we are looking forward to for this year for the foundation. Uh, new issues of the Cycle Magazine coming out in June, Science Summit, which we are currently launching, uh, but of course a future one to follow. Uh, and then in late June, the mid-year market cycle summit. Be great to know how many of you here today were there back in Jan uh, when some of those very strong forecasts were uh, originally made and, and many of them actually uh, came true. Uh, cycles education course, which is something that um, has um, part of the uh, team effort I am leading in terms of creating a, a, an in-depth foundation course and a diploma that people can consider uh, for the study of cycles. So that, that'll be a, a long-term work in progress, but there'll be uh, plenty of news to share at different milestones um, of the way. Um, and recently confirmed in terms of next steps, the republication of one of the landmark publications of Dewey um, is something that we uh, will be uh, progressing in and, uh, and we shall update you more 
um, as the news prevails. Um, and then last but not least, alliances with other influ influential cycles and market analysis societies and associations. Uh, we always try to be stronger together with other professional groups and, and just general ambassadors in this field. Okay, so that's day two, and that's what uh, to look forward to. Uh, quick word on, on FSC membership, uh, the benefits for those of you existing or new, regular webinars conducted by members of Cycles com community, the community member forum, a fellowship of scholars, scientists, non-professional investigators who are passionate about cycles analysis and how cycles can be used for the betterment of mankind, which is truly the mission of the, of the foundation. And then of course, keep in mind that we do um, have cycles app, uh, the software uh, that allows you to actually tangibly measure cycles and, and watch them as they develop. Um, that allows the decoding and the analysis um, of dominant cycles across many data sets. And of course, the, the YouTube channel that we have um, uh, is, is led by uh, Lars uh, on the team who actually uh, gives a regular segment on the, the Cycle app. Okay, and then a big thank you to members. Uh, remember that you are helping to fund all of the events and materials we're planning to release um, this year and, and future. Um, how can you continue to help? Of course, donations are always welcome. Uh, there are different ways uh, to, to express that, um, including continued support towards raising awareness, contribution of ideas, time, community. Uh, please uh, uh, support in, in whichever way um, seems best. Um, I will share some links in, in the Zoom chat in a few moments uh, for those of you that want to click and follow up. Uh, meantime, just visit our website for more details on uh, cycles.org. And just a reminder for questions that you want to ask of each of our speakers and, and David in the lead here, David Marin, uh, who'll be speaking shortly, uh, if you can send it to the Q&A box, uh, just so we can uh, uh, have it centralized in one area. Um, and I will uh, note them down and prepare for the end of his session um, so that we can have a, uh, a good and meaningful uh, interactive discussion with everyone. And, and I will, end on this one question for everyone, just to test uh, the chat function. In the main chat function, if you can just share your insights on what is your interest in the cycles of science and nature? Why is that important to you? Um, and why is that of interest to you? Uh, cycles of science and nature. If you could just type that in the chat, uh, just as a, a brief insight share from many of our members and attendees from around the world, what is your interest in the in cycles of science and nature. So I'll complete on that. Um, if you have any questions uh, uh, for the foundation or for myself, the details are there at the bottom. Um, and I will just now uh, click forward to introduce our first speaker. So our opening speaker, David Marin, I've, I've enjoyed our, our early New Year uh, interview on behalf of the foundation, and I really am excited about you presenting this new groundbreaking work on breaking the code of, of wars. I, I, I know in our recent discussions on call, uh, this is part of a new book that you'll be publishing soon. So this is real exclusive stuff that you'll be sharing with us and, and uh, the, the foundation members uh, attending. Uh, as an intro to yourself, for those who may be new to uh, you and your work, um, as, as the bio uh, explains, David is very much a polymath known for his re remarkably uh, present predictions and theories. His career has focused on recurring patterns of history, using them to try and predict the future for markets and society in turbulent times. In his 2009 book, Breaking the Code of History, which I highly recommend to everyone, originally conceived as an investment thesis in 2002, he predicted the hegemonic challenge of China that would lead to World War III, a topic of great interest to everyone nowadays. Uh, by 2025 is, is, is the prediction, and that the next great viral epidemic would originate in China from a planned weapons laboratory. Um, and then finally, David founded Global Forecaster in 2019 to both warn of the inevitable series of entropic waves uh, that would engulf the West and to advise on ways to mitigate and survive them. David's advisory and speaking work is based on the direct investment experience of 25 years as a macro CIO combined with a framework that can be used to explain and qualify strategic and investment decisions 
while avoiding being subsumed by unconscious collective thought processes. Uh, I'll leave you with that. Um, important and uh, I think insightful in, uh, intro on, on David and his work. And I'll uh, hand over to you, David, for, for, for sharing your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. It's really kind of you to introduce me that way. And everyone, it's lovely to be with you this evening, this evening, UK time. I don't think I've ever given a lecture this late. Um, and of course, the Foundation of Cycles was founded after a great social upheaval in a quest to try and understand whether there were signals beforehand that could have warned of the event. So it's a great privilege to be here as we face, I think, future events of bigger magnitude and the importance of the foundation to the outside world really couldn't be underestimated. And I really hope that um, people in power get to listen to some of the insights which are discussed at the summit. Right, and we're off. So uh, my first book um, was called Breaking the Code of History. And this follows and extends many of the theses within it. Um, and obviously it's particularly relevant. We, I, was able to predict the war in Ukraine with a 95% certainty within the time window it took place. And I'm gonna share with you the insights that led to that conclusion and the same insights that really um, focus us on the fact that we, in my studies work, are treading the path towards World War III as we speak unless we in the West wake up and understand that only through deterrence can aggression be prevented. Um, I started Global Forecaster in 2019 with a rather unique perspective. And that was, I decided to stop managing money in 2013 because I could see the printing of money as the final stages of the American system would go on for longer than I wished to fight it. And I always understood it had a fundamental limitation and so I decided to take a break, do all sorts of other things. And I came back in 19 in the summer and realized that really, I thought that we were very close to that period when the system would start to crack and break. And of course, I thought about starting hedge fund again. And I came to a very simple conclusion that earning money um, and becoming wealthy wasn't going to help because I wouldn't survive the experience of what came afterwards unless I could share the insights and knowledge that were partially revealed in breaking the code of history and Moreover, their acceleration in areas which weren't discussed and how to mitigate them. So I started Global Forecaster really to disseminate that information. And Global Forecaster has three kind of constructs. One is the Global Forecaster, which is for everyone, the general public, just about everyone to access. It interprets the world in the framework, some of which I'm going to talk about, gives real time geopolitical updates. But it's really about predicting what comes next and inferring the construct I've designed that gives and empowers people to think for themselves rather than rely on someone else's analysis. And that's really kind of taken off in the past couple of years as we successfully predicted the pandemic from the 5th of January onwards, captured the market fall and many of the subsequent things which have happened. Global Trader is essentially a hedge fund that people access and they access it. Uh, and we don't manage money because that inhibits the ability to communicate our message. But the top what firms in the world access are alpha generation strategies, which harness many of these algorithms, which I'm going to talk about. And then global strategies is there for governments, large corporations, which don't trade markets, which sit in an environment that they have to learn to adapt and prepared for. And they're ill prepared for because, as I'll argue, most of them are led by linear leadership, which are unable to anticipate the phases of what comes next. All of this is available to you. There's a huge amount of information in the public domain. The theory section will re-emphasize some of the things I talk about, although some of the things I talk about are inside the global forecaster piece, which you can access relatively cheaply. So it's all out there for you to follow up, and I look forward to running you through this. It is groundbreaking. Only one other organization has really heard that, and that's the top of the UK military. So what I'm sharing with you for the first time is really like groundbreaking stuff. Um, I've written four books, which as a dyslexic, I always find rather amusing. Uh, and I mean a really thoroughly dyslexic, dyslexic. And it changed for me in 2005 um, after I had conceived the investment thesis, which predominantly was about you know, breaking the code of history represented. But I was just feeding milk to my twins who are a week old and thinking, what sort of world have we brought them into? And that really I had to communicate what I'd learned about the way these cycles were operating in the decades that were really our decades that we were responsible for, that if we didn't, 
understand what was happening would leave we left a school church for our children and it drove me to start to write and somewhere in the next day or so I could write something that the next day I could read which was a small miracle and the product was breaking the code of history which came out in 2009 which was essentially conceived in 02 just after 9-11 the second book was rather amusing. It was it was really brought about because my uh, son uh, gave him a, a couple of models. They were Mark II tanks, the era of 1916, and the Somme, and he asked me to help him. And in my spare time, I make models. So I did, but I couldn't just make a model. I had to build a huge diorama that took two years to build. And so I had to make that worthwhile. And I hope it looked to find a battle in the First World War that would be interesting. And of course, you know, most of the history books are liberal dominated, and you hear about the Somme and Passchendaele and what a waste and lions led by donkeys and how stupid the generals were and what a waste of life it was and I came across this battle in 1918 on the 9th of August where the British army attacked using tanks artillery airplane in a unique form of combined arms warfare and in four days pushed the Germans back stopped and then punched somewhere else using the same techniques and with 100 days Germany being pushed back to the start line where it had invaded from the outset of 14. It's a story that is little told it's a story that's really a revelation about how the tank was the, the core of that innovative process and how actually the lions were led by lions and that leadership migrated from peacetime linear processes to lateral leadership, which adapted to a battle winning strategy. And it also talks about the analogy between Germany and China, Britain and America then. Funny enough, the Kondratiev cycle was at the same phase. And oh, here comes the other cat, excuse me. Every presentation has a tail. Um, uh, and essentially, uh, it, there are lessons for today from this history book. Now, never was uh, really an attempt to wake Britain up uh, as a leader of Europe, that it had to spend money on defense and anticipated the threat from Putin, which would be opportunistic and aggressive and of Russia. And sadly, the, the defense review, it wasn't listened to. Um, so I created Red Lightning, which is really the story, an emotional story of how the West loses World War III in 2025, which is a predicted window for that outcome, and talks about the details of how carrier power, in effect, is dissipated by hypersonic weapons long before we heard about them in Russia. Uh, all of it tells a story, and that story has led to some of the conclusions I'm going to tell you today, we'll talk about. So I think one of the key issues is why do we fight wars? I mean, no one likes wars. No one thinks they are acceptable. Yet throughout history, human beings have gone to war with other nations and killed each other in varying degrees of depravity and violence. This picture is taken in the Spanish Civil War of um, a, a guerrilla who would died. Some people talk about whether it's real or not. But the why is really fundamental, and it's driven me in my study of conflict. And to explain why, we really need to look into who we are as a human race and how we got here. And so I created the theories in the Breaking the Code of History, which covered the five stages of empire. It covered polarization of systems, i.e. how they dehumanize the opposition at the point where they could then go to war, how they fought wars, which we'll talk about a bit, has been no, no war is the same because of where it is on the empire cycle. But why we fought them, I hadn't really addressed. And my answer to that, is a theory which I recently uh, released. It's called my theory of human anti-entropy. And it's quite simply the construct of human survival. Humans have adopted a, a survival strategy in an entropic universe. I entropic, I mean that the you know, second law of thermodynamics means that heat will go to zero and the whole system will lose its energy over time but also entropic as in waves of destruction which overcome the natural environment that we have to live in. And our strategy for our DNA's continuation has been social amalgamation. We're stronger together than we are individually. And we create collective societies. We started with small tribes and they became bigger. And those societies have hallmarks which operate to give us the ability to eventually change the world around us. Now, obviously, they started off small. And I think the Roman Empire is a good point to understand the transition. And if you look at our lack of understanding of the real world at the time and our dependence on the deities and gods which societies formed, it showed you how much we didn't understand. And the Roman Empire in its early stages was polytheistic. It had many gods and each god sat over the top of a domain and you prayed to that god if you wished that domain to yield fruit, for example, fruit being wheat. 
And if there was a drought, obviously you had angered the God and the wheat didn't appear and you suffered for it. So you did all you could. That was their net understanding. But by the end or the, the two thirds through the Roman Empire, Christianity, which is monotheism, was increasingly adopted. So how did a system go from a polytheistic to a monotheistic process? Quite simply, it became more dominant of its environment and less dependent on the unknowns. Take, for example, wheat supplies. Wheat might have been domestically provided in Italy. You needed a god because it was localized and subject to local weather. And suddenly by the end of the empire, if you didn't get it from Italy, you got it from Spain. If you didn't get it from Spain, you got it from North Africa. If you didn't get it from North Africa, you got it from Egypt. So in effect, the size and diversity of the resource chain in the Roman Empire meant that deities attached to the production of food and other products actually were no longer needed. One by one, it moved from polytheism to monotheism. And that is the story of humanity's progression. The bigger the systems we create, the more control, the more technology, the less the natural environment has a hold on us and the increase in our collective survival. Now we create collective organisms, which I'm going to define a bit as the largest empires. Those empires grow in population, they rise, they create social coherence, they become effective, and they sweep aside the older system. Because the one thing that our collective survival can countenance is moribund sequescent cells, which are not functioning. Empires which are alive but half dead, and they're removed by more vigorous systems, and they're removed by a simple process of war. War has been an irreplaceable construct for the removal of the old and the decaying with the new and the vibrant. And the consequence is that each system that's replaced by another system on the whole reaches a new peak of collective anti-entropy and more control over the world around it. So there we are looking at Ukraine thinking, we can't believe this is happening to us in the modern day and age. And the simple answer is, we shouldn't be saying that. We should say, unless we understood that war was part of our process, where weakness of one system begat challenged by another, then basically that system is going to keep happening. That's what Putin did. He saw weakness, he struck. He made an error of judgment, but he perceived weakness and that begat his strike. So this lesson is very simple. As soon as systems become old, sequescent, then they become vulnerable to rising systems and the way that they're displaced is inevitably through conflict. Now, there's many other parts to this anti-entropy theory, but the key issue is that every member of our armed forces will be required until we collectively understand that our progression is linked to conflict. And until we consciously find a way to find another way to progress our societies where old ones are swept aside and new ones replaced and more vibrant, essentially wars will be a part of human existence. That's a very, very hard construct. But that's how we got here, unconsciously, through the acts of violence. And interestingly enough, those acts of violence seem horrendous, but they really do kill a very small percentage of society as a whole, of the, of the human race. But we're coming up to this critical moment where, just as we did in the Cold War, total nuclear exchanges can kill the vast percentage of the population. So I think we're coming to a point which I call consciousness or catastrophe, the point where we realize that this cycle of expansion and growth can no longer rely on warfare when our weapons are so destructive. And I think this decade is the decade of consciousness or catastrophe. Now, when you look at humanity and the first thing you've got to do is really ask the question of who are we? And my seminal perspective came, and you'll hear about in other interviews, by being in Papua New Guinea and watching New Guineans share collective emotions so that they all resonated the same emotion. I've seen that emotional pattern in markets. And the, the simple conclusion is we are a collective organism. Humanity is not just a group of people who live in the same space. We're people that share collectively our emotions and perceptives and perceptions verbally through external signals and on some level, on a quantum level, and we are bound by it. But we are not a homogeneous system. And this is one of the revelations that really shocked me, is I do not believe that all humans are the same. Now, we understand that some human beings, when they run, are faster than others. We understand that their physical shape gives them advantage on the 100 meter track. It's very obvious to us. But what is not obvious, is the way that our brains differ. The way that we think differs. And it's much harder because you can't see it. You can only see it in action. You can't see it on first encounter. And I 
I have a theory, which is my lateral linear theory, which basically looks at human evolution as originally hunter gatherers were lateral. They had to be every day they solved problems to survive. But essentially, when we created an agrarian society 10,000 years ago, we became more predictable and a linearity came into the agrarian aspect of our societies, which were where the main population expansion took place. So today there is roughly a ratio of 70% who think linearly and 30% who think laterally. And that is a symbiotic dynamic, which when it's working well together is very effective. But actually it has some fascinating balances, which I'm gonna talk about, about how systems rise and fall when predominant ways of thinking are in action in those systems. And predominantly lateral thinking expands a system and linear thinking takes control at the top when there is stability because an empire is a monopoly. So your entropic events drop off. But when the system starts to encounter increasing number of events, it loses adaptability by excluding lateral thinkers. And their linear thinkers literally pilot the system into the ground, which is exactly this condition America is in right now. So the genesis of breaking the code of history, and it's important to talk about this because I think genesis of, of, of fundamental perceptions are always interesting when you understand how someone came to the conclusion. Well, some of it's to do with my background. I was always interested in conflict. I studied physics, uh, which made me extremely logical in the way I tried to pull apart complex problems and find essential equations or constructs that explain them. I had been traveling all my life when many people in England in my era didn't have that opportunity. I had a family that came from the Indian army. So I was linked in some way to an empire system which had fallen, but I was interested in. And most interestingly, I'd been in Papua New Guinea and seen this collective behavioral pattern. So when I joined JP Morgan, the first thing I observed was that economists weren't very good at predicting things. Some individuals from the East End without education were quite good. And most importantly, that the collective behavioral patterns I saw in Papua New Guinea were replicated on the trading floor. So I made the simple analogy that they've had a bunch of, you know, cray computers, which are reduced to pocket calculators when they're in the collective psychology. That was a huge insight. And from that moment, I became fascinated by the quantification of price and became very successful in its prediction as a proprietary trader and changing with another very key person in New York, the way the bank perceived risk on a fundamental basis, right the way through to the top of its uh, board, such that Time Magazine had a front cover with a conch shell saying, how does JP Morgan really make its decisions? Where do you go from that? Well, you set up your own hedge fund and that's exactly what I did. And we'd been very successful and along came 9-11. I remember seeing 9-11 on television my father was a senior aviator, so I'd been brought up with the aviation. I knew what it was the moment it was shown. And we were all shocked by such an event. But I remember pondering, what if? And I do most of my pondering in a bath. And I remember thinking, what if this event is not just a random act of terrorism? What if fundamentally, because there are so many acts of terrorism that could have been perpetrated against America that were stopped by the intelligence agencies, what if it was a fundamental failure of the immune system? And what if that failure really represented com competition between agencies that didn't share information? Is there some bigger implication? Yes, there is. That would happen in decline. So then what if when we think that the Western world has started just another century of success, that actually it's hubristic to really think that, and actually we're in a state of decline. And that state of decline mirrors the USSR, which split off from the Western world in a twin dynamic. Now, in, believe me, 01, early 02, those thoughts were really like earth shaking. So then I thought about the next problem. Okay, how could I see it in price? How could I see that wave of change coming when the data for stock markets reliably isn't more than 100 years? And could we be looking at a 500 year cycle and where would I find it? And that was when I thought, well, what happens if I knew that price patterns in markets had patterns and there were emotions attached to those patterns to the collective behavioral pattern. And there were people that behave within those patterns like lovely little signals who would be reverse indicators, be fearful before it went up, all sorts of dynamics, which I'd noted and studied. What happens if I constructed something that wasn't based on price, that was based on collective behavior? And what if I constructed it using wars as the clocks of empires? And that was the genesis 
of the five stages of empire from which my first really big observation started to flow. The five stages of empire model, which I published first in 2002, is essentially five stages. Its essential driver is at the bottom, which you see from this area here, is expanding demographics. And expanding de demographics shape the need of the system to organize effectively. So as demographics expand in regionalization, you find the population getting bigger, but only a few people at the top really have control and power. So the pyramid of power is extremely narrow. And the result is more people wish to be enfranchised, more people wish to represent themselves in power. But most importantly, on the scale of linear to lateral, usually at this stage, the leadership is very linear because the system has been stable for a long period of time. Its variables haven't changed. And the fundamental thing that happens here is a regional civil war. And that regional civil war is driven by lateral thinking, seeking to expand the system, have better representation that displaces linear thinking, and a civil war ensues. And in that civil war, there is only one outcome. The lateral thinking outfights the linear thinkers. And so at this stage, a regional civil war is completed. The system becomes militarized. And essentially, the first thing it does is start to fight its neighbors and expand up its resource chains. And because the whole system is fully lateralized, it literally rips everyone apart around it. Anyone who's moribund or stationary gets carved up and, and basically outfought. And the system adds itself algorithmically. One plus one equals two, two plus two equals three, three plus, you know, and it goes on. And literally, as it moves up the curve, it kills faster and quicker and it assimilates faster. And so it's a really exponential growth curve. If you go back, to 2002, and I talked about the rise of China. No one could conceive China's parity with America and the speed at which it moved from really a nascent sort of period over here, because it actually spent a lot of time stuck down here under the ceiling of American power, and it ripped through a system with a covert strategy of expansion is a shocking concept, and any linear thinker could never have contemplated it. At some stage though, the empire reaches total expansion. It can't go any further, it reaches the balance of its geographic limits and communication, and it moves into a stage of maturity. And maturity is fascinating because it becomes tolerant. It's when it builds large institutions, large um, architectural structures, which embody the value of the empire, are all built in this period as wealth flows in. And interestingly enough, there's a massive debt cycle that happens here. But this debt cycle powers the USP of empire. And so essentially, once it becomes a monopoly, the debt is quickly paid off. At the peak of the cycle, there is a subtle transfer of power. Sometimes there is a civil war. Sometimes there's a constitutional crisis. But essentially what it represents is a displacement of the maverick lateral thinking energy that created the system with the linear thinkers that create political structures and are far better collectively in making those structures work. And as long as there were no external triggers and entropic events, of course, linear leadership looks really great. And it works and as long as it's a straight line. But over here, something interesting happens. Gradually, the lateral thinkers and the productive creativity is removed, and the system loses relative productivity. And it starts to compensate by essentially increasingly borrow money. Because, of course, everyone wants to lend money to the empire because it's a dead cert, and it's huge, and there's no one else around, and it's a monopoly. So slowly, debt starts to build in a second mound until you reach a point of overextension. And overextension and this point of decline is a point like 9-11, where the outside world sees the system fail. And from that point, it only has one compensatory process. It has to spend and print money on an epic scale. It loses productivity. It faces new opponents. It creates a power vacuum into which any system nearby starts to expand and move. And this is a series of retrograde actions which lead to the, the, the failure of the system. That cycle is, has been repeated across most empires in history because I studied them all as part of my study. And there are hallmarks which are over here you can read about, and they're all very clear. And at the time when I wrote it, no one even had an idea about this process. Now, of course, we know what decline is like because we've lived through it. And we remember the more sunnier days so we can see what it was like in opposition. So this whole thing will resonate far more now than it ever did. This basically is the debt process of the US. And you can see this double mound here. You can see, you know, World War I borrowed money like crazy internally. 
And after World War I, effectively, it became an empire. It started really after the American-Spanish War. But the, really, after that, it was now ingrained in the power structure of the, old, of, the, of the old world. And it was deeply influential in Germany. It had a major part to play in actually the collapse that followed 1929. And then, of course, as a monopoly, it ultimately paid it all down. And you can start to see as it moved into overextension, it borrowed money. And this is the image that was published in my book. And of course, this arrow isn't here. It's through the roof over here. And of course, there is no one to pass the baton to. So a debt, a debt crisis is inevitable for America and not far away. One of the problems I noticed with my model was that somewhere from about 1400, the empires of the West started to have shorter durations. And I thought, well, could this be technology? Could it be acceleration of some kind where technology accelerated the whole cycle? And I looked at every aspect. And then it dawned on me that actually, if you looked at the Western Christian system as a religious system governed by a meme rather than national structure, we found one of the first mimic empires of which the subsets were the empires, the Dutch here, over here, these are Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch in orange, the French empire, and then the, the biggest one of all of them by a long shot, Britain, which peaked in about 1870. Germany tried twice here, once as a Christian system, once as an atheist system, and then here's America, the last of the Western Christian empires. Now, what's interesting is the First World War was at the peak of the Western Christian empire. It was a civil war between Germany ultimately trying to rip dominance from Britain by going through France. And the Second World War in Europe was really just the same war after a hiatus. And America's decline started in 2001. Once that cycle became apparent, I really started to understand just how these little cogs had been working together to create the system and where we were and how significant America's decline was because it wasn't just about America, it was about the decline of the whole Western Christian empire. Now, obviously looking around, I wondered whether there were other super systems and it became very apparent that there was another parallel system and that was the Asian super system. And in fact, Japan was the first of the Asian empires and China was the second and India is the third, much as we had the complex systems in the West. So basically, this conflict between the super Western Christian world and the super Asian system goes back a long time. In fact, the first time that conflict showed was the Japanese-Russian War at the turn of the 20th century. And it was a time when the Japanese beat the Russians and with the help of British naval planners and the Royal Navy, funnily enough, and the idea that a nation society could be equal to a Western society was born. And this system came of entity. But essentially, the really powerful expansion is China's expansion to empire. And it's driven with India not far behind it, some 15 years. So it knows it's got to get to that pole position, displace the West before India come of age and works with the West to shape the balance. So I would argue that Xi's target for global dominance is 2030. It's not 46. It's by 2030. So everything we talk about here in the hegemonic challenge is dictated by those relative challenge points in this cycle. So when you superimpose the two, you see something that's really clear. We are sitting in the decades from 2000 to 2030 of the transference of power from west to east. Now we can see that in terms of the demographics and the GDP process, it's very clear where the world's GDP is, but never or ever has GDP not been translated into military capability. And hence we are seeing the biggest arms race since the first world war a huge arms race, which many in the West are asleep to. And the thing to key remember about that arms race is that America's power in the Second World War and the First World War came through the sheer brute force of its manufacturing industrial base. And we in the West were seduced to invest in China's and China now is the greatest manufacturer in the world. And it's increasingly dedicating that capability into supplying weapons for its armed forces. And that prognosis doesn't look good for the West. And this was a revelation. This is Britain. This is Britain in its empire cycle. And you can see as a story, as we go through the regionalization, the defeat of the Armada, the English Civil War was exactly that regional civil war. And then essentially the expansion empire between the Anglo, the French, the Dutch. It's all pretty quick up here. These wars all marked the clocks of expansion of the British system, completing in Waterloo. But in fact, Trafalgar was the dominant moment. 
for Britain controlling the world's oceans. And then you can see over the top Queen Victoria's constitutional revolution. And now these wars really were all wars of decline for the British Empire. Suez, World War II, World War I, they were the declining systems that ripped whatever wealth the system had from its hands. And then you saw these prime ministers of collapse and you've seen presidents of collapse in America with similar hallmarks, I might add, to the ones that presided over Britain's decline. And I'd say James Callaghan has very similar hallmarks to Joe Biden. So the cycle in America is repeating frighteningly similarly. But then we came to the bottom of the cycle and along came a lady called Margaret Thatcher, who I met personally was extremely formidable. And the Falklands War, which did two things. First of all, it reasserted British national identity, the courage, the fortitude to go 8,000 miles and win back those islands was a considerable military feat and an act of political will. It was one that redefined Britain as we would lose no more. It was one that defined Thatcher's whole reconstitution of Britain as a vibrant, um, self, you know, self-starting driven system. And it, she re-kick-started a new cycle. But that war also, as we'll come on to, was a pilot war, which meant that the Soviet Union could no longer think capitalists were weak, could no longer assume a physical land invasion of Europe would result in weakness and the failure to use nuclear weapons on their own territory to repel it and ultimate victory. The Falklands War changed that perception. It was a pilot war, which meant the Cold War stayed cold. The Britain cycle continued after Thatcher. And essentially, this whole process around Brexit was an English civil war mark two. It was lateral versus linear. It was about internal versus expansive. And once again, lateral leadership won. And it represents an enormous sense of hope, in my view. It's the first regional civil war that was ever conducted without bloodshed. And it suggests that mankind can find new social constructs within old frameworks to harness what are very powerful energies and come to conclusions. However, the disadvantage for Britain is unlike a war, which quickly sweeps aside linear leadership for lateral leadership that's highly adaptive, we ended up with lateral leadership at the top and every other part of government remaining linear. And so there's a bit of a sort of doghouse clog where essentially the lateral people were advised by linear thinkers and we haven't had the real rejuvenation. We've seen signs of it. The vaccine pandemic response and the Cape Bingham process was one of them. But the biggest one of all was Britain leading the charge and supporting Ukraine with 4,000 end laws, which I would argue for military reasons saved Ukraine at a critical moment when the Russians were forced to go down roads because the, the surrounding land around it was soft. In effect, the lateralization of Britain also started to have world effects in terms of Ukraine's survival. And I think Britain has been leading the charge as a re-energized democracy, basically in terms of the defense of Ukraine. What we haven't been doing is leading the charge in defending ourselves by increasing defense expenditure, which we will talk about. So the question has to be, is where is Russia in the cycle? <laughs> Quite simply, Russia that started in its expansive process that led all the way to its peak in 75, which coincided with a commodity peak we'll talk about, essentially has been, was in decline and entered legacy and just sat there as a social organization. It still has the worst demographics in the world. So it is in legacy with no sight of social reformation. Putin has tried to re-stimulate the birth rate and without demographic expansion, there is no example of history of a system starting a new cycle. So when Russia started this cycle, it started it not as an expansive empire, it started as actually a moribund system in legacy. And that is really interesting. So how did Putin think that he would have any chance of success? To understand that, we've got to look at another cycle to understand where his confidence came from. And to do that, we've got to understand that human beings fight only one thing, and that is resources. And every sense of evidence is that resource acquisition and resource pricing is the drumbeat of conflict to systems that are expansive or wealthy. And we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, I became fascinated by Kondratiev's work um, some years ago. And the thing that really fascinated me was the number of wars that manifested at the peak of a commodity cycle. They're listed here, the Napoleonic War, the American Civil War, which you can read about the resources of the South were a huge trigger. World War I is probably the biggest example. 
And the peak of the Vietnam War is really interesting because if we go and model the Cold War, we can model the Cold War on one Kondratiev cycle, roughly starting in 1950, and essentially when the Soviets got the bomb and, and nuclear parity. And as you run up to this period, Western society suffered terribly from inflation, and it was input inflation as commodities rose, and Russia and the USSR was a key commodity producer. So you had a commodity producer facing off against a consumer. And of course, as that cycle moved into its peak, this was a time when people thought the West wasn't going to survive. We had 15 degree percent inflation in America. And essentially, people wondered how communism worked so well and why we couldn't confront it. And they had more money to basically invest in global spots and their willpower was stronger. And that was the weakest point of the Cold War. Interestingly enough, that weakness, as we'll come on to, was when America was strong. And this goes back to my book published in 2009 and the prediction of a nation war in 2025. I've left this because it's not a recent picture. It's a prediction made 20 years ago when I first found the Kondratiev cycle had started and was investing in things like Lucol at 60 cents, which we sold at $64. I became aware that if the Kondratiev cycle was real, which it ever proved to be, then we would face a global conflict somewhere around 2025, which would be linked to the hegemonic challenge of China over the West. That's 20 years ago. Now, the power of cycles to predict that is something which I think is relevant to the foundation of cycles. Their power is quite remarkable. Imagine if we had leadership that understood that, and instead of continuing with a peace dividend into the oblivion, they understood that actually they had to ratchet up their defense capabilities as commodity competition increased into a particular decade. The advantages of living peacefully with low expenditure and yet securing the peace in difficult times when friction increase would be unestimable. Um, I have known Tony Plummer since the dawn of time, and this is another way of looking at the Kondratiev cycle. His work is truly worth looking at. He's one of the most capable people in the cycle area. I love him to bits, and he very kindly uh, has worked with me for a long time. And this is his estimation, which shows another version of it. And you can basically see the cycles coming down here into this low in 2018-19, and then this super cycle move, which is the C wave, because I would view it as an A wave from 2000 to 2010, a B wave, which was counter trend and deflationary, and a hyperinflationary surge. Now, going back to this other chart, oops, we're going forward too far, doesn't let me go back. This is another way of looking at it. This is uh, quite simply CPI and bond yields. And this is the last cycle. And you can see here just what was happening in the Cold War, 15% CPI, 15% interest rates. No wonder America felt as a consumer society, its economy was buckling and bending. And of course, no wonder the miracle of the communist society looked like a miracle because it was producing inflation hedged commodities. And then you can see from this time onwards, essentially how as commodity prices decreased, two things happened to the USSR. Their system was fundamentally uncompetitive and they had huge overheads with the standing army. And armies, unlike navies, are fixed costs that do nothing but sit there or fight. But navies secure trade routes, make friends, enhance economies. So there's two very different forms of spending depending on the force structure. What is really interesting is what happened in 2000. In 2000, just down here, Essentially, instead of inflation restarting, it flatlined. Instead of yields starting to go up again, like they did over here, they went down. Something really dramatic was happening in a manipulation of this normal relationship. And that dramatic manipulation was the outsourcing of expensive manufacturing to cheap China. It was something that the Chinese encouraged. It was their idea of extracting IP, of Western investment, building their manufacturing base, which they knew they could use back at the West. And we fell for it. But all of this process here is resulting in the buildup of an inflationary dynamic that is a tsunami. It has three components. Not only is it input inflation led, it also has, and that alone would worry me because we're going to 15% CPI and we're going to 15% interest rates if we're going to the same high. But remember, this high was made by a consumer society facing off against a commodity producing society. And actually, it's half the peak of 1914. So if you look at this, it's two great consumer societies, the West and China facing off. And you've got to assume this alone will take you to 30% inflation and CPI before you add back in the reversal of manufacturing from China and also the amount of dollars printed. So not only is inflation 
not transitory. It is a, the Hoover Dam breaking in front of our society, producing stagflation and lack of growth on a most epic scale at a time when we face hegemonic challenge. So one of the things that I like to do is I count waves. Um, it's one of the cycles I've used right from the time, and right from the beginning. And if you go and use the oil price and you measure the metric of Putin's behavior, there is a high correlation. So Putin over here in 2000 was pretty pro-Europe, desperately wanted to join the EU because, of course, when the commodity revenues were so low at that part of the cycle, essentially there was no hope. So you need to be part of a bigger system. But then commodities and, and oil particularly started to move up. Oil was very cheap to produce in Russia because it was not far below the surface. And so essentially revenues increased and he became more confident there was another way for Russia, so much so that in 2007, he declared that he was against NATO because of its mistreatment and Europe of Russia post the collapse of the war. This was the point of belligerence. Now, obviously, he faced a little bit of a glitch and then up it went. And of course, his belligerence was just through the roof at this stage. And he was increasing belligerent into this point. Now, he must have really felt a little surge of doubt when the, when the prices did this. And had he been a bit sort of early, if you could get in his mind. But very soon we were back up to this area. And this area spent a long time at a high price. And it was this period that truly filled Russia's coffers. And somewhere between here and here, and certainly starting back here, the Russia, Russia initiated new strategic programs, like its Satan II program, like the Status Six um, drones, new submarines, new weaponry, that would give Russia's strategic deterrent the ability to, to survive through anti-ballistic missile technology and also keep it relevant and also provide the umbrella for what he perceived to be his future aggression. And of course we had Georgia and then the price started to drop. And over here, you've obviously got what happened in Ukraine. Now, Ukraine was, in my opinion, a product of a number of avenues. One, Putin was seeking to break the relationship between the weapons of mass destruction by the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Remember, in the Cold War, if you used any weapon, biological, chemical, or nuclear, you got a nuclear weapon on your head. It was a given, so no one did it. Essentially, in this paradigm, he sought to use chemical weapons with impunity. Obama tried to stop him with a red line. It was violated. Um, Obama was humiliated in the New York Times article directly in a letter by Putin. And the whole thing was jolly unsavory as far as Putin, Obama was concerned. And with American instigation and European support, a revolution spontaneously appeared in Ukraine, which was pro-European and anti-Russian. Now that was the catalyst for Crimea. And I think in many ways, we went too far without directly protecting Ukraine from what was obvious would come next which is a Russian incursion all the way back then. And the reason is quite simply, their oil and gas would have displaced the Russians. So it was a commodity motivated action, not one based on freedom, individuality and democracy. And we went too far. And we also continued with this blinding mindset in the West that we were so superior, we didn't have to spend money on defense and failed to see the rise of Russian defense spending and the rise of Chinese defense spending. Through this process here, I was arguing there was still a chance that if you approach Putin as prices went lower, his vulnerability of his strategy would mean that he could be seduced to the West to surround China because his bigger fear was China because he knew they might subsume him, whereas he knew the West never would. Of course, we didn't do that. We sabotaged all those dynamics. We got to the low and that low in 2000 was the end of the B wave. So in terms of Kondratiev cycle, your A wave is this portion. This is a deflationary B wave. And now all hell is let loose. We've got ourselves here, wave one, which is basically finishing just up around the recent highs. We've got some kind of two, but where oil goes in the next three years, ultimately I think is three to $400 as inflation goes through the roof. And of course, if Putin is still in power, which I don't think he will be at the way the course of events flow, Russia's situation will be enormously emboldened. And I think the economic sanctions we've tried to put on Putin do not work against a commodity society in an inflationary commodity cycle. They're far stronger, which is why the ruble has been stronger afterwards than it was before. And no one in the West understood that we were taking on, we were essentially taking a knife to a gunfight as a consumer society versus a commodity society. Now, even if we can resolve the Russian issue and neutralize Russia, we still have China. And the brutal news is commodity prices go through the roof. Hegemonic competition comes 
to an ugly head in conflict. So this cycle here is the drumbeat of World War III. Now, if you think about wars and empire, and this is something that I released in Breaking the Code of History, but has direct relevance, wars are not the same. Obviously, there are regional civil wars, and they're about the lateralization of a system with linear leadership. There are peak wars, which tend to be linear systems displacing lateral systems. Interestingly enough, if you use World War I as an example, Germany was far more linear as a land power than Britain was as a sea power. And actually it was a linear system trying to replace a lateral system. So that's very common. And then you see wars of fracture down here as systems break apart. They're all internal conflicts. Wars that you fight against other systems to gain their territory are wars of expansion. And they're always fought when you have lateral leadership because your system is predominantly lateral. The problem is in decline as you defend your territory, the leadership is linear. It's non-adaptive. And it obviously faces a challenger from the other side of the curve who is lateral. So the chances of success decrease if you have equal forces. And you know, as time goes on, it's harder and harder to defend your territory. Now, in terms of what this means for the Western Christian Empire, these are all the great wars of expansion, the Anglo-Dutch Wars, the Anglo-French Wars, Trafalgar, Napoleonic Wars up here. The German challenges of France were kind of part of Germany's expansion process. World War I was the peak civil war. World War II was the second part. But what was happening over here from World War II onwards was something that we haven't really clocked. And that was they were wars of decline of the Western super Christian empire. And they were wars of expansion for the Asian system represented by Japan, Korea and Vietnam, the latter two being supported by China. So we have been in this struggle between East and Western systems at war for 100 years since the Russians and Japanese went to war. So the idea when I first started to talk about it to the world that China would seek conflict with the West, which seemed you know, un, un, just not possible to most people, was to me entirely plausible because it had been going on all the way through a 100 year period. We just never articulated with the correct words. So when China expands in its next phase of aggression and believe me China is about as aggressive as any system can be with 55 percent males it has need 55 million young men that it could lose in conflict and be back to 51 percent which is the balance point of normal aggression it is a testosterone driven society and highly aggressive and will leap into a gulf that another system wouldn't take to take the risk to expand with constrictions of time so the thing to remember for the West is the West's struggle with Russia by proxy represents an old system, and we've talked about it being legacy. The Russian army's limitation is it emulates the society it comes from, so its national energy is very low. Its ability to wage war and adapt is obviously not good. It faces a highly motivated Ukrainian army that has already adopted a command-led structure back from 2014, which means that lower levels of command have high authority on the battlefield and are adaptive. And it has a command centralized system, which makes it very vulnerable to having those central nodes of communication and command incapacitated. Its biggest challenge is that Western intelligence sits over the battlefield and they're like a fish, they're like fish in a bowl. And the Ukrainians are given targets by the West, masked by commercial intelligence to the public. And essentially, it's very difficult for the Russians to move or act. At the point when they focused on the Donbass, essentially, finally, America realized that Ukraine could lose, started providing the offensive equipment required to, to actually push Russia back. 90 long range howitzers would do the job with counter battery fire. And you're seeing the product of that outcome Russia being ablated you know, on the battlefield. If this was a proper peer conflict, Western intelligence capabilities would have been ablated long ago and it deteriorated until the fog of war fell upon us too and the whole war would have been completely different but having nato fight from neutral territory and inform the ukrainians on the battlefield is an asymmetry that no one could have really anticipated in a modern conflict like this by proxy china is completely different though china is not in contraction it's in accelerated expansion and it's an opponent america and china and japan are in legacy and terminal decline. So the energy of one system is far greater than the other. And that other system, as in China, has spent decades working out how to create asymmetric advantage 
over the capabilities of America. And predominantly America's capability is carriers, carriers projected power. And so the Chinese learned to ablate it and they've done it with long range ballistic missiles and hypersonic warheads, which is a subject of red lightning. And I would argue that the balance of power in the Asian seas has completely shifted away from America. And actually I question whether America can intervene to actually protect Taiwan. So a balance of power and opportunity are approaching that represent a moment in history that is extremely dangerous. But the question about assault and attack, and this amazes me, is actually the origins of the pandemic. Because as I mentioned in my book, I hypothesized that the Chinese would be involved in biological weaponry to seek asymmetric advantage in the hegemonic challenge. Therefore, weapons laboratories linked to the PLAN would be a source of some kind of intentional accidental leak. The use of that weapon would obviously not be a full on kill and transmit biological weapon because it would induce a nuclear response. So the natural place to create it was something with asymmetric advantage, something with a relatively low killability, high transmissibility would have been the agent. And so when we saw the agent in Wuhan in December, I immediately identified it as not an accident. It certainly was a manipulated genome. And our only question is, was it an accidental or intentional release at the moment of release? Because after release, the Chinese did everything they could to maximize its transmission and ensure the West used lockdowns, which economic strangulation. And the purpose of that, we'll see in a minute, is essentially to maximize the debt in Western society such that it was disabled in an arms race to match China's investment. And in that regard, it has been frighteningly successful and we're still asleep to what's been taken away from us. This is the US stock market. So one of the really big questions is how representative is a stock market of the state of an empire? How can America be deep in decline and yet its stock market be at record highs? That's a question you all must have asked. But the answer is really simple is it's the response to decline which answers this process. So if we talk about 9-11, which is, oops, sorry about that, a little bit of, a little bit, oh, we go. Right. So 9-11 is back here, somewhere in this place here. And this was essentially the first part of the correction which took place where, where America started to print money. It did it strategically because of course, America's economy had to be maintained under, under attack. And so let's just say it used three times GDP's leverage. And up we come in this first surge. We then drop into the 0708 drop, and somewhere around 10 times is used over here to basically hold it up. And now we create this massive printing of money, this decades rally, which is you know, a beta trend from heaven, filters out every lateral maverick, you know, alpha generator in the system, and replaces the whole financial markets with predominantly linear beta driven mechanisms. This process here was the one we captured successfully with the arrival of the pandemic. And this drop was just another correction. But what took out here is in Elliott terms, a fifth wave extension, the biggest bubble in financial history on top of a bigger bubble, which had taken over here, a bubble which was driven by the biggest debt mount in history as America printed money. So the printing of money comes in decline and the, and the blowing up of assets comes with it. Now we all know if you know anything about Elliott's wave counting, is that fifth wave extensions, when you accurately find them, are the end of the whole bubble. And the bubble will deflate and go back to its origins. And its origin, in this case, 2020 lows and as low as 08. So we're talking about a secular bear market over three years. And the reason why I have confidence in it is I used the fifth wave extension when the NASDAQ was 15,000 to predict a precise high and the mathematics of 16. At four seven sixteen seven four two, and it got to ten ticks away from that. A point at which all my clients were instructed to sell the maximum amount they could, and have been mega short ever since with less than one percent of risk. So we're in a secular bear market, and this is not just a bear market; it's the bear market of a hundred years of growth linked to hegemonic dynamics in America. And there is no way the Fed can provide a put because it's been washed by inflation, which is completely out of control. Even if inputs change, the other elements are just too powerful. So what we really have is a series of entropic waves, waves that assault 
the Western Christian world and particularly America. Now it's ironic that America is led by one of its most linear leaders, but it's very typical. The last linear leadership was Carter. We know how bad Carter was. Biden is a factor worse than that. So the lack of adaptability of America to change and challenge has never been greater when those challenges are upon America and the West. Britain, I think, is already showing adaption, but not to the level it could do unless it completes its lateral revolution. So these entropic waves are swamping the system one by one. So what lessons can we learn about how to survive entropy? Well, this is Lions Led by Lions. And the British Army started off as a peacetime organization in 1914, one of the most effective and professional. Um, its small BEF was very responsible in slowing the Germans down until the Battle of Marne threw them back and established the trenches and arguably saved the day. Um, and that was little more than 140,000 men of the BEF. And when the Germans faced them, they felt like they were facing machine guns with companies rather than men who could fire multiple rounds per minute accurately aimed. But we fared very badly in this new form of warfare, as we know, as this leadership wrestled with defensive weapons dominating um, uh, defense and the inability to break that defense. Um, and then came, obviously, with time, the migration of new leaders. Now, by the time the Battle of Amiens took place, the Fourth Army was commanded by Rawlinson, a very capable leader, and I would say a, a lateral thinker and extremely capable commander. His subordinates of three corps were this gentleman over here, uh, Curry, who was in charge of the Canadian Corps, one of the crack corps on the front. Uh, this gentleman over here commanding the Australian Corps. And over here was a friend of Douglas Haig, who we look in a far better light with the study. But basically, he allowed this adaptation to take place. And, and that he deserves huge credit. But Butler had never been a combat commander, was a friend of his, was put in charge of the Third Corps, lasted three days and had to be replaced. These gentlemen distinguished themselves in not only the battle, but the formation of the tactics that would work. So Britain really only started to win because it allowed lateral leadership to win. And there's a fundamental lesson. Our services all require lateralization now because there won't be four years in a war to create a migration of peacetime to wartime, linear to lateral. And our governments need to be lateralized because only if we do that, do we have a stance of really adapting to the challenges we now face. And you can see that process because we have a new age of conflict and you can see the lack of adaptation of the Soviet forces and the way that new weapons like N-laws and drones are fundamentally changing the balance of power on the battlefield. And that balance of power is always going to be in China's favor as a challenger because they'll adopt them and use them in new techniques and strategies faster than the encumbrance system is prepared to do it themselves. So there's a, the, the really dangerous thing about Ukraine is that the Chinese are watching. They'll derive the lessons faster and they'll put drone technology into deployment faster than the West in a scale that we can't match. And that's one of the great dangers of this war. It's why wars are like a virus. They keep spreading. They don't stop in one place because aggressive people learn from them and then find adaptation. As I mentioned, Britain, for example, hasn't spent enough money on defense. But America, although it spends more thanks to Trump, the way it spends it, the inefficiencies and the rigid thought processes in some areas of defense make it vulnerable too. And certainly its political leadership, because of its lack of intention to use its capability, as demonstrated by the route from Afghanistan, makes even a capable force less capable and deployable and less threatening to the Chinese. So what do you do in this circumstance? Well, you need to create resilience. So you need to secure your resource chains. That's one of the key lessons. You need to do it because you're in a Kondratiev cycle. So if there is a demand slump, which I expect as a stock market continues lower, that slump has to be used to reinforce resource chains. This is an old image that comes with creating a wartime economy. And I think there's a huge case that Western economies shouldn't be into a wartime mode, but they should be emulating a shadow wartime mechanism. For Britain, that means accelerating growth. That means low, lower taxation rates, and it means borrowing money when you can for the long term before a debt crisis, which follows the stock market's decline, engulfs the West. It means securing our future through debt at low rates that you know will inflate away. And I know that sounds crazy to you, but now is the time actually to blow the barrels out to get 
50 year debt, a two year like war loan, and use it to secure your country's defense and key infrastructure through a five year cycle, which is, you know, before we see any abation of inflation. That would be the smart counter intuitive thing to do right now, even though debt is the very problem which makes us vulnerable. And on the other side, you've got Xi, who's becoming increasingly agitated, aggressive and expansive. People look at him as a commentator and think that his economy is in the poo. Some of it is his own making. He's intentionally replaced manufacturing and export with internally fueled consumer society. And the last country that did that was Germany in 1936 after the invasion of the Rhinelands. But, uh, and that was based on its four year plan to go to war, be bust. I think China has entered the same paradigm. And what we see in supply constriction is not a random process, but part of the constriction because they're no longer manufacturing to export, they're retooling and refocusing. And essentially there's an evolution that goes with weapons and we've got to stay ahead of them. America can't afford to have carriers they can't defend. And they know that, but they need to think that war isn't five years away or two years, war could be tomorrow because it's the opportunity she will take at any moment of political weakness. And that weakness is upon us in Biden. And there must have been a conversation being between Biden and between Putin and Xi, which is we need to move before Biden dies in office because he looks a bit old. And that's their challenge to act when they have the weakest opposition. Uh, now, obviously, America's found some kind of coping mechanism where Biden's executive decisions have been devolved in a fascinating way ever since they, America has placed more emphasis on interacting with Ukraine and the lend strategy in the past few weeks. So maybe we've seen some sort of subtle constitutional shift in power, even though Biden looks like he's president, his executive authority is somehow being changed by the people under him. Um, so this gives you some idea of timing. It gives you some idea of the immediacy of the cycles and the need the Western has to wake up that the epidemic Ukraine were two warning signals that we live in a period where aggressive actors will act. And in this case, I see China, North Korea and Iran and Russia acting simultaneously. So they won't just do it individually, they're like a pack of wolves. Um, you can see our predictions with markets, you can see our theories, and I hope today has really opened your eyes to the linkages in these cycles and their importance, and that they're now issues that are present and upon us, rather than something that are theoretical in the future. And that by sharing these constructs, you will create a cascade of change that, in, in, that dynamizes people to demand more of their leaders, lets leaders expose themselves and realize that we need to actually protect ourselves with deterrence rather than sit passively hoping it's all gonna be okay. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Fantastic presentation, David. Uh, following on from our interview early this year, and I, I thoroughly recommend everyone uh, rewatch uh, what you, the insights you just shared now, uh, but also the, the ones that we exchanged together uh, as, as a double uh, dose of um, understanding and, of course, for, forecasts uh, that we have yet to wait for. Uh, now, in the minutes that we have, David, I, I have many questions uh, that have been asked, but uh, a selection of, uh, of a few uh, that, that um, uh, I can follow up with. So I'm just gonna, where possible, ask them based on some of the themes that were highlighted and, and maybe help with, uh, with, with facilitating some of the questions. Okay, so there's, there's a question on, on, on cycle applications in terms of, um, have you found conflict to occur every 500 or every 500 plus years? So the pattern, the duration of conflict cycles. Um, I haven't, I think it's very, very tricky to say, is there a 500 year cycle when that cycle is, the cycle of an empire is 350 to 400 years. And I think people need to not just pick a war out that happens in history. Oh, there's another war. You need to actually look at, what, what what system you're looking at. So I'd look at cycles within an empire, but you can see from the empire that in fact, every war has a different role in it, from a regional civil war to an expansion war to a contractive war. Now, I do think there's regular points. And you know if you look at a contractive cycle of 56 years, that's one of the ones that sits very comfortably inside an empire's experience. But 
bigger cycles than that, I A, haven't studied and B, suspect they'd be quite hard to find because you're looking for a bigger cycle imposed on a smaller cycled empire system. So it wouldn't make sense to do that. And, and on that point uh, of the Kondratiev wave uh, cycle, we had a brief exchange over the weekend in prep to this event. Uh, and one of the points uh, was the variations of the K wave. So as best as you can in, 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 a, in, a, in a sound bite or two, what can you say about the, the variations of the K wave and how that aligns with the different nations? So, so one of the things that's really interesting is obviously, if you look at Elliot's construct of 5-3, but you look at, so 5-3, five, 5-3, three, five, three, but if you look at very long-term cycles, like the one I showed you with oil, which is the K cycle, essentially it's, it's, it can be 5-3, five, 5, or it can be 3-3, three, three, 5. And what's interesting is that there's a way a 5 looks like a 3, if you go one, two, and the four is very big, and then you get an extension in the fifth wave, that looks like three, three, three. So there's an interesting crossover between those that argue long-term cycles have you know fives and threes in them, and actually a way of interpreting. So there's a unified mechanism of interpretation. But that cycle I showed you with oil is pretty much no different from a corrective cycle, and corrections have an infinite variability. They are really quite fluid in the way they shape themselves. So, you know, they can take on different forms and details as all corrective wave cans in smaller fractals in any wave. So there's a lot of variability within it. For example, it was quite interesting. I would say that this cycle probably went two years longer in its deflationary cycle in the B wave and 18 would have been a natural low. The fact we went further was because the superimposition of a declining empire, the deflationary dynamics of it, the export of all its manufacturing to China meant that they could keep that one rolling for longer than a normal cycle. It's still a cycle, but it's points are harder to actually determine. And you can't always predict them. You've got to, like all wave counting, turn the pages and see how those patterns unfold, knowing the blueprint you're working with. Very good. And, and to follow up on that, on the subject of, of war, um, and, and civilization. Uh, we have a, a, a very insightful and timely question from Chris B. Uh, was there a war during the Renaissance? Can intellectual and society not advance without war? Um, and, um, and just to preface that, I think that the great in inventors like Tesla, Da Vinci, innovated without war, would not the freedom to think freely lead to more change rather than war? <laughs> Okay, so, so, as best as you can. So, all right, so, so let's, let's, <laughs> answer, let's answer this process really interesting. You may not have seen the chart of the super Western Christian Empire, but it regionalized as a Catholic system, Spain and France. The real war of its regional civil war was the war of the Dutch British wars against Catholics, because Catholic systems are about control. You control access to God, you control your thoughts. It's everything goes through the church and that confers power. It's a very good example of a linear system. And along came the Protestants who protested that they could access the divine directly. And they disintermediated the church and Holland and Britain adopted Protestant beliefs, which gave far greater lateralism to thought. And they fought in a more lateral way as a product of their underlying beliefs. And ultimately they were the system through sea power that expanded Europe from a European system to a global system. So yes, you can have individuals who create without war, but systems don't respond that way. Very good. And then uh, to, to follow, a um, question from Yoel. Um, David, do you think there will be a nuclear exchange between USA and Russia? Um, so we are coming to the point somewhere soon if the land war in Ukraine continues at the rate it is, where Russia is ejected from Ukrainian soil. And I think one of the uh, things that, that, the, that the West is desperate to do is not to make it too sudden, which is terrible for the Ukrainian people who suffer in the process. But their reasoning is to bleed Putin to the point where he is weakened and to the point where when he comes to use his de-escalation strategy on Ukraine to make them surrender, that his, the people around him say, you can't do it, we've already lost. Now. I do think there's a way of preventing that. And I think NATO should turn around and say, for the purposes of the release of nuclear weapons, we consider Ukraine to be NATO territory. In no other way, but if you use a nuclear weapon, we will retaliate. Because it's that, that 
ambiguous response which offers the window for Putin to think he might have advantage. And we do have to close that. And the difficulty you've got is you've got a desperate Putin and you do have two of the biggest arsenals in the world. And we are currently <clears throat> walking, I would say, and have been since this war started, at a level of nuclear risk akin to the Cuban Missile Crisis, even though we carry on the same way. Accidental launch, miscalculation, you know, Putin's strange imperative has changed that whole balance of our security, all based on the success of the threats he made around nuclear de-escalation, which kept us out of Ukraine. Until we challenge that and break it down and show the courage to confront it, we all live under its shadow. Thank you. And as a, as a final uh, uh, question selected from uh, a broad mix, uh, from Jeff H, uh, please, can you say more uh, about what defines lateral linear leadership and thinking? How can we recognize it? This is something that touches on the behavioral implications of cycles, uh, which is close to the heart of our chairman, uh, uh, Dr. Richard Smith and, and myself. So it'd be great to, to have a final word on that, David. Well, there's an awful lot of information on the site under human collective systems, which you can follow up on. But essentially, um, in summation, women are far more cross-lateralized than men. So this idea that women multitask, do things simultaneously because of, you go back to tribal origins where they you know, did all sorts of things simultaneously, they tend to be far more cross-lateralized. And there's a statistic, there are far, the ratio of left-handed women and left-handedness is one of the markers of cross-lateralization. Left-eyed is a cross-lateral marker and dyslexia is. There are less left-handed women than there are left-handed men because there is less of an advantage for them to be extreme versions of lateral. But men are very polarized. They are, they are either lateral or linear. Some are ambidextrous, but then they sit more as a more lateral. And so think about um, if you're, if you're left-eyed, if you're left-handed, if you're dyslexic, you will fall in the lateralization process. If you're linear, um, uh, you will find challenges outside the perspective of collective thought difficult. So for example, if I ask people about what do they think about UFOs and do they think aliens exist, you would find a range of responses. Lateral people will probably have investigated it and some of them will have an opinion. And if they don't, they'll be open-minded to it. But extreme linear people say, well, no, the poppycock, are you kidding? It's no rubbish. It just gets dismissed out of hand. It's the construct where you know your parameters and you defend those parameters with your whole soul as if your soul is defined by it. And that's the problem. It creates rigidity of thought and low adaptation. It's great in a stable environment. And it's great in symbiosis. If you see, if you link lateral thinking for like a search radar to see things that are coming and you listen to them and linear people operate everyday processes effectively and iterate, that works really well. But the moment the linear person thinks they can take control of the ship in a storm, disaster strikes. The moment a lateral person thinks he can look after a widget factory, disaster strikes because he loses attention, goes to sleep, and the factory blows up. So each has its advantages and disadvantages, but there is very clearly a pattern of all great leaders are lateral. There are very few highly successful linear leaders because they lack feminine empathy, which is one of the hallmarks, too, of that process. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I see Ray here on screen. Uh, if you have any any uh, words to share be before we uh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to, transition. I'd like to ask one question of David. Thanks for your interesting talk. Um, you, you were predicting, I think, is it both the collapse of the American dollar and the um, uh, collapse of the markets? If that's the case, uh, from an investment point of view, this is a science conference, but I'm sure we all have investments too. Uh, what's the safe thing to go to? Is it gold or what is it? Well, I think right now, probably cash is your best bet. I know there's, a, yeah. there's an inflationary price for that, but gold and precious metals are looking just like Bitcoin. There's, there's almost like a preemptive washout taking place because yeah. people know that when risk comes off, every gold and silver sell off. And so basically some of these havens of reservoirs are, will get lower prices. Now, somewhere in the future, in the weeks and months ahead, there will be a reversal in gold and silver that you really want those assets. Even Bitcoin at 15,000, you want the asset when everyone sold out of it in the first wash. And that's when the acceleration might have taken place in the stock markets. So it's not a simple correlation. Right now, I think cash is a very lovely, warm, cozy place to be. Yeah. Thank okay. you. It's a pleasure, Richard.
Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for listening, everyone. And uh, really, it's been a great privilege and honor to speak to you. Uh, and it, it has uh, been very much uh, uh, an honor for us uh, to, to host yourself and our follow-up speakers uh, to come. And for the questions that have uh, been asked um, uh, in the chat, but not uh, followed up with yet, we'll ensure that they can be emailed uh, directly to David. And, and with, if that's okay, David, it'd be great to, to hear back uh, so that we can, we can, we can just, share just, with them. Just, just tell everyone to just go to the site and there's an Engage David page and you can, just go, you can engage me through that process. And also just have a look at the site first because I suspect that many of your questions will be already on the site. So you know, just have a look and see if you can self-answer. And if you can't, then come at me and I'll, I'll fix it for you. Yeah, absolutely. David's active um, with, with his, his writing, I mean, both in terms of books, but also uh, high frequency on, on writing on, on the blogs and social media. So feel free to outreach directly. And of course, we'll happily facilitate your questions directly to David um, as part of the, the, the value of attending this event. Um, as a member and attendee. Thank you very much, David. And, and I'll, you, I'll now, we'll now prepare for, for our follow-up speakers. Super Thank you, David. Duper. Take care. Okay, uh, so in keeping with time, uh, and of course, uh, following up on a, on a similar uh, uh, topic in terms of geopolitics and crisis with the prediction of American cycles and crisis in 2027, I'm very excited to uh, reintroduce um, a well-known uh, friend of the foundation and speaker from last year, uh, David Katzmeyer. He's a professor. He's a profession uh, originally in web, web development, audio uh, recording and editing, website SEO, social networking, radio show production, and other technical engineering. Started his own company to manage this called uh, the Web Elves. In his past work, he was an inspector for the Department of Public Safety and uh, health uh, of his home city. Subsequent to that, he entered the mainframe data proce processor at Dallas Computer Center, property management in Philadelphia, and internet management for a prominent bookseller with thousands of listings online. Katzmeyer is on the advisory board of the Cycles Research Institute, and he had made the study of cycles his lifelong work after discovering an original theory in 1978. He calls his work the cycles of change. And with that, uh, and no further ado, uh, David, over to you. David Katzmeyer here from the United States. Hi, and thank you for that introduction. Thank you also to Ray Tomes of the Cycles Research Institute and to the Foundation for the Study of Cycles, my Mecca. Uh, I discovered the world of cycles in 1978 became a member of the foundation in 1979. So it's about 43 years that um, I have been with the foundation for the study of cycles and uh, learning from them. That's been my resource and my focal point when looking for leadership. So um, I prepare a little introduction for what we're gonna talk about today. Let's see, it goes like this. The cycles of change is a theory that all nations have a set of internal rhythms that begin at the time of birth or revolution of the nation. For the United States, that beginning was in the American Revolution. We have been riding the waves of three main cycles ever since. They influence the United States with undulations of creativity, spirit, and productivity. Since these are consistent cycles, their positions are predictable. Each cycle has its highs and lows, stages of development, and points of crisis. Once in a great while, two cycles will enter the point of crisis at the same time. That happened only three times in American history. They happened when they were due, and each time was calamitous. The fourth time lies just before us. Regardless of what is going on around us, our internal rhythms will have us set for upheaval within. This is the crisis of 2027. By knowing this, we can prepare and fare much better than if we were caught unawares. It's all in the cycles. So uh, when we were talking about this conference, uh, the idea of presenting a little video was mentioned. So I prepared a 32 minute video, which is gonna play here in a second. Please watch, think of your questions and ask your questions at the end of the video. Thank you very much. Can we play the video?
Hello, I'm David Katzmeyer with a look at the cycles of change in America. We are a nation of cycles. Rhythms in time and periodic chaos reveal cycles in the American experience. We as a nation move in rhythmic change. Times are not random, even though random events occur. As we ride through these times, we rely on cause and effect to gain results. But what causes do we choose and when do we choose them? We may seek predictability like time weather reports, but until we understand the underlying influences and how they move us, our predictions will be more like traffic reports as we bounce off the invisible guardrails of life. So where do we begin to find the rhythms of our nation and to understand them? Start right where you are. In the pedagogy of our social structure, we live by the unwritten rules of people who died long ago. We also inherit more than that. We inherit our position in the cycles. Each of us is born into our place in a family, our position in a community, the times of our nation, and our hour in world history. Such is a fundamental tenet of society. And we live in that society like cells in a great organism. By the same token, we are connected to people not yet born and that our work is their inheritance. There will come times when our work is sought and preserved. There will also come times when the past is abandoned as people search anew. Then history will be cherished again. What is lost or forgotten from today will be rediscovered as we are rediscovering truths once known long ago in many times. Poet Vyslava Simborska said, every beginning is only a sequel after all, and the book of events is always open halfway through. So understanding our surroundings is a type of self-awareness on a mass scale. For that, we have only the anecdotal evidence of our behavior. This is a behavioral science of inaccurate measure. Yet it may be the best tool we have to identify the manifestations of energies. We interpret the varied manifestations, but the energies themselves are exact in form. How can this be? Can we believe it? Some would say yes, for we practice this notion every day. Stock market analysis and prediction, after all, is observation of human behavior. The study of cycles plays a key role in that. With or without the study of cycles, billions of dollars of product development and emerging markets are based on trends. So the use of technical analysis with cycles versus the fundamental approach of mere observation are in fact two sides of the same coin. They both arrive from the same source, trends of human behavior. We come and go, cycles remain. There's a lot to figure out our place in it all. These things may seem elusive, yet we can learn just as sure as a round earth rotates and orbits the sun. We can discover the invisible forces that trigger events as it was so eloquently put by Edward R. Dewey, founder of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. These forces remain invisible only until we find them. Then when we do, we recognize them immediately and forever. It's like finding a face in the cloud. Once you see it, you can never look at the cloud again without seeing it. Yet you looked at the cloud before and saw no face at all. Now I ask you to open your minds and see a face in the cloud that you don't see in the sky. You see it all around you as you lift your head from the herd. You will find it as you seek things greater and outside of yourself and find that they are within you as well. You will glimpse our place in the revolving tendency of the universe for the face in the clouds is us. The idea that history moves in cycles is not new. Knowing what the cycles are, however, can be another matter. How long do they last? How do they influence us? How many are there? Big wheels keep on turning in world history. Smaller wheels make national trends. Even smaller wheels are in our lives. Through it all, we live in a confluence of cycles within cycles. It may seem complex, but complexity comes from simplicity. When you understand something about some cycles on any scale, you learn something about related cycles on every scale. That's when you can think of your nation as having a life 
like a person. The cycles of life you know in your own experience may be playing out in your nation. The patterns are similar, but they play out on grander scales of size and time. Some might say we live in a self-reflecting holographic universe of isomorphic fractals. Suffice it to say, it's a lot simpler to think of it as a hall of mirrors. From this perspective, the life of a nation becomes ever more fascinating as each nation has a life and identity of its own. As a nation goes through stages of development, it has good days and bad days. It has an internal clockwork of rhythms that continues throughout its life. Once we know that clockwork, we can foresee our highs and lows before they happen. This is a brief look at one nation, the United States, and its internal clockwork of rhythms. As Americans, we ride undulating waves that all began with the birth of our nation and the American Revolution. These waves have been moving with consistent patterns ever since, so they are predictable. We can plot their influence on us at any time, past, present, or future. This helps us see how they played a role in our past. They enable us to better understand where we are now, and we can forecast our tendencies in the future. Once you know the timing of these cycles, you have an internal map of time. Regardless of what happens to us and around us, we are riding on waves within us. National rhythms do not predict actual events, and they do not tell us what other nations are doing or how they might visit their changes upon us, but they do foretell our state of being and how we might respond to whatever happens. What is our physical level? Will we have war hawks in Congress or be prone to pacifism? What is our emotional level? Will we be expressive, idealistic, and speculative, or regress to inward mediocrity? What is our intellectual level? Will we calculate, invent, and ponder, or find declining test scores among uninterested students? These all come with the tides of national rhythms. Knowing what time it is on a national clock may tell you when to buy into a rally or when to sell before it's too late. Knowing these cycles can reveal much more than just highs and lows. They can also bear warning. Cycles calculate some of the potholes in the road before we hit them because a time of crisis is built into a cycle. Know the cycles and you know the time. This message comes in an important time because of where we are in the United States. We are approaching our next time of crisis. It will happen on a date that was determined before we were born, and that date lies just before us. The magnitude of this crisis will leave such an impact as to rank among the most turbulent, cyclically induced turmoils in American history. We will survive it, but its effects will be hard felt and long remembered. Times of crisis like this happened before in America, just three times before, and they came when they were due. We know them as the Panic of 1901, the Stock Market Crash of 1929, and the Watergate Affair. The next crisis is nearly due because mathematical precision and cycles that have determined it, and it will be time. However future generations may remember and name the upheaval that lies before us, we shall refer to it here as the Crisis of 2027. The Cycles of Change in America. It all began with the birth of our nation and the American Revolution of 1775. That began a system of three internal rhythms that have been moving in our nation ever since. These rhythms correspond to the body, the heart, and the mind of a nation. A physical cycle brings change to our strength and production. An emotional cycle changes our mood and aspirations. The intellectual cycle changes our ideas and our learning. Together, these changing energies bring changing times for America. The names of these cycles may sound familiar in that they are physical, emotional, and intellectual. The same aspects found in a person can be found in a nation. A nation is a collection of all the thoughts, feelings, and actions of everyone within the nation. That's why noted philosophers have drawn a comparison between a person and a state. German philosopher Oswald Spengler identified stages of civilization as having birth, youth, adolescence, maturity, senescence, and eventually death. With this, Spengler compared the life of a civilization to the life of a person. 
Italian philosopher Giovanni Battista Vico concluded that stages through which Western civilization have passed had counterparts in pre-Greco-Roman civilizations. With this, Vico said that civilizations are cyclical. Cycles of our lives, therefore, may give us clues to the passings of the ages. We've been aware of rhythms for a long time. Consequently, you can find a chart that gives the times of coming ocean tides because they move in rhythm. You can find calendars that list the next phases of the moon because it moves in rhythm. Now we can plot the times of change because our times change with rhythms as regular as ocean tides and phases of the moon. Seasons of time are changing dramatically now and everything around us is changing with them. Periods of chaos and crisis also come as regular parts of the cycle. Now for the first time we can put our knowledge together and see the highs and lows and times of chaos before they happen. They are encoded in the mathematics of life, encrypted in the American experience, and decoded here in the map of time. Highs and lows. There's a generic pattern that is true in all symmetrical cycles with periodicity. Simply half the cycle is high and half is low. The cycles of the United States are periodic and symmetrical. The sine wave motion undulates between the forces of yin and yang in the duality of nature. Physical highs and lows. This changes our physical strength in a 28-year physical cycle. For 14 of the years are high and 14 of the years are low in energy. During a high in our physical strength, we increase our construction, industry expands, the military is more ready, we play sports better, our health and fitness improves, and we are acrobatic in dance and other endeavors. For 14 low years, we lessen these energies. Emotional highs and lows. The 36-year emotional cycle comes with 18 years that are high and 18 years that are low. This changes our faith, our hopes, our dreams, how we worship, our idealism, our sense of romance, and the expression of the arts. For 18 low years, we lessen these energies and we are less enthusiastic. Intellectual highs and lows. During the 44-year intellectual cycle, 22 years are high and 22 are low. Highs bring expansions to science, education, invention, commerce, literature, and finance. After that, we decline. Quarters. When a cycle passes through highs and lows, it goes through four stages of development. These are like seasons in nature. The first quarter. When a cycle is building, it starts at the midpoint and rises towards the peak. This is the first quarter and the time of foundation. This is the spring of the cycle. You can make the analogy of a tree of life making blooms and sprouting seeds for future times. This is when we build anew and set down foundations and precedents to establish what will be the course for many years. Second quarter. After we hit the peak, we come down through the most energetic time of the cycle. That is the second quarter expansion, improvement, and variation. It is the summer of the cycle. This is when we branch out on the foundations that we built. Everything comes to fruition. You can imagine a tree of life making its limbs as full as possible. This is when we become eclectic and make variations on themes as much as we can. The third quarter. The high ends when we go down into the low half. This is the third quarter of review or autumn. You can imagine a tree of life losing its leaves for the fall. Many trees experience a spurt of root growth in the fall. Likewise, we forsake growth at this time and return to our roots. This is when we reflect and look back on what was done in the cycle of time. We have reforms of anything we don't find favorable, and we have nostalgia for that which we do find favorable. There is a time for looking forward and looking back. The fall is a time of looking back, a time of regression. The fourth quarter. The cycle bottoms out as we rise up through the fourth quarter to begin anew. This is the winter. You can imagine a tree of life losing its dead wood. This is when we downsize, we seek alternatives, and we oust anything that is old and unneeded. We have an abstract concept of what we want, but new things will not take form until the next new cycle is high. And the cycle continues. Whether you are following a cycle of 28 years, 36 years, 44 years, or a cycle of a few months. If it is a true cycle of this nature, it is likely to follow the same phases of development. This is a universal pattern for cycles. 
crossovers. When the cycle crosses from low to high, or from high to low, it must go through the midpoint of transition. We shift gears, as it were, as we go from high to low, or vice versa. This is the crossover, a time of crisis in a cycle. It goes through the midpoint and will stay in crisis for one year in America, no matter which cycle it is. Physical crossovers. If it is the physical cycle, it changes our strength in a crossover as it goes high or in a crossover as it goes low. This will, perhaps, give us industrial recessions, strikes, or violence. If you look at these things back through history, every single time this cycle crossed over the midpoint of crisis, one of these things, at least, has happened. Emotional crossovers. Emotional crossovers will cause panic or rioting or outrage, like the Rodney King beating, or strikes in Alabama when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. These are things that are emotional. Intellectual crossovers. In the intellectual cycle, when you have a crossover, you can have severe drops in the stock market, or you can have an historic shutdown of the federal government over philosophical disputes, as we did in the intellectual crossover of 1995, and again in the intellectual crossover of 2017. These are ideological conflicts that will manifest while people who have power are controlling a nation in crisis. Cycle Overview The basic pattern of highs and lows, four quarters of change, and critical points of crossover is the generic pattern for a cycle. Every country has had the same cycles of change that we've had. These are 28 years, 36 years, and 44 years for every nation. Go with the trends. Go with the tides. You won't be swimming upstream to go in a straight line. The currents will get you there faster if you go with them. Birth of a nation, the United States. The United States was born in the American Revolution of 1775 when all of our cycles began at once and began to rise. In a very short time, they began to separate and create a fugue, a three-part dance, if you will, that changes in a myriad of ways through time. Highs and lows combined. You can see what combined highs and lows can do. The only time in our history when all three cycles peaked within a decade is during the 1920s. From 1919 to 1929, the intellectual, physical, and emotional cycles all peaked. We don't call that the Roaring Twenties for nothing. It was due to be high. From the day we were born, we were due to have a heyday in the 1920s. The only time in our history when all three cycles had a trough within a 10-year period has a name. We call it the Great Depression. The physical, the intellectual, and the emotional cycles all hit the bottom and that was a terrible economic time. Double crossovers in America. 1901. What happens when two cycles hit a time of crisis at once? In 1901, we found out for the first time. That's when President McKinley was shot by an anarchist, and Teddy Roosevelt succeeded to the presidency. The era of big business ended as huge trusts and monopolies lost control. All industries like copper, sugar, meat, tobacco, and stock prices fell dramatically. It's now known as the Panic of 1901. The crisis was so severe it threatened the collapse of the entire banking system. 1929. The second time two cycles hit the critical point at the same time was 1929. We all know something about that. The emotional cycle peaked in 1928. Our enthusiasm was running very high. We were speculative buying. Everybody thought we had the war to end our wars, and we had a bright outlook for the future, and you couldn't lose. They used to say not only could anybody make a profit in the market, but should make a profit in the market. But as we were one year from the emotional peak, an unprecedented physical and emotional double downward crossover took the floor right out from under our feet and the rest is history. And it happened one more time. 1973. 1973 was another double downward crossover that ended the era of the 60s. That's when the Watergate affair began that led to the resignation of President Nixon and most of his cabinet. Economists now refer to this period as the recession of 1973-74. We had two successive quarters of very downward conditions. It's also when the oil crisis began. That's a lot for one year. 
but not when you consider that it was due. Let's take a look at the last six crossovers in American history. 1991, an upward emotional crossover. 1991 to 92 was an emotional upward crossover in the country. That's when Rodney King was beaten. It happened to be called on videotape. We've seen the hideous acts of racism and violence before, but this particular one came at a time when we were in a state of agitation. After the surprising acquittal of the aggressors involved, riots broke out across the nation. In other events, soon-to-be Justice Clarence Thomas was going through hearings for alleged sexual innuendos. William Kennedy Smith was on trial for rape, and boxer Mike Tyson was convicted of rape. 1995 Upward Intellectual Crossover 1995 to 96 was an upward crossover of the intellectual cycle. This is not physical. It's not going to set back land values as much. It is not emotional. That would create moral outrage and rioting. This is conceptual. It's intellectual. And what happened? An historic shutdown of the federal government over philosophical disputes. The greenbacks went into a downward spiral as the U.S. dollar reached a post-war low of 80.15 yen. The Dow Jones plummeted 171 points on Friday, March 8, 1996, which is within the crossover year. The crossover year lasts from March 21 to March 21 of the following year, spring to spring. That was the third largest point drop in our history. We lost $186 million in stock values. A crossover is a serious thing. 1999, upward physical crossover. 1999 came with an upward crossover of the physical cycle. The Columbine High School shootings took place on April 1999. Two students brought weapons to class and fatally wounded 14 other students and one teacher and 23 others in Littleton, Colorado. Another shooting happened at Heritage School in Connors, Georgia, by a 15-year-old boy who left six fellow students wounded in May 1999. Similarly, 4th ninth grade students of South High, Cleveland, Ohio, were arrested for planning a school massacre like the one at Columbine. This is also the time of the Internet bubble burst. In the 1990s, many businesses were running on speculation and banking on hopes of investors. Some even falsified the reports and profits. During the physical lows, some institutions were not running on substance, and their assets consisted of little more than computers and telephones. When the upward crossover sorted out the real from the imagined, only those institutions founded in tangible assets survived. 2009 Downward Emotional Crossover 2009 to 2010 saw an emotional cycle downward crossover. Emotions and tempers ran high as irate citizens demanded political reform in town hall meetings across the nation. An emotional grassroots campaign against government spending grew. This began the Tea Party movement that called for reform through most of the following third quarter reform in the cycles. 2013 Downward Physical Crossover This was a physical downward crossover year. This is when we had the Boston Marathon bombing in April of that year. The nation was also experiencing economic woes, and Detroit followed for bankruptcy. 2017, Downward Intellectual Crossover. 2017 and 18, in this intellectual downward crossover, the federal government shut down over budget disputes again. This was the largest shutdown of government since the shutdown of 1995, which was also an intellectual upward crossover year, with the intellectual crossover of 1995-96. The Physical Emotional Double Upward Crossover of 2027-2028 America will be in a critical time of vulnerability from March 21, 2027 to March 21, 2028. Years for a nation follow the natural tropical year from spring to spring. They are not synchronized with any man-made calendars. Any time within that one-year period, our time of crisis could come, March 21, 2027, to March 21, 2028. This will be the fourth double crossover in our nation's history. It could result in widespread overreaction with possible acts of violence and public outcry. The industrial sector could suffer a sudden yet brief recession. In the crossover, 
We should be cautious with our responses in foreign relations as we could be agitated and have a propensity to use force. Still, this will usher in a new and exciting era in the 2030s and a new high time for America, but that time will come with birth pangs. Our next internally induced crisis is set to be physical and emotional in nature. Mathematics may tell us when it is due, but it does not foretell the events that will take place. So it is up to us to look around at what is happening now and suppose what is brewing before the event. With that in mind, here is just one possible set of causes that could be fueling an eruption in 2027. Remember, this is just one case scenario and not the only possible scenario. Still, the crisis is coming, so with speculation and imagination, here are some things happening now that could spark an upheaval when it is due. America has long valued its independence and freedom. In contrast to that, concerns are rising over dwindling empowerment in three areas. National sovereignty, personal privacy, and self-determination. This could precipitate a grassroots revolt against what some perceive as a techno-political state. Sovereignty of nations is yielding to global control. Traditional currencies of nations may give way to global digital currencies that are regulated by the International Monetary Fund. Momentum is growing to move away from traditional national currencies and towards centralized IMF-controlled digitization. The IMF published an article in February 2022 titled, The Future of Money, Gearing Up for the Central Bank Digital Currency. Around 100 countries are exploring central bank digital currencies, and a few are already distributing them to the public. Healthcare within nations may soon be partly regulated by the World Health Organization. A shift is on for the WHO to determine policies for individual nations regarding vaccinations, as well as a wide range of other health-related matters. The COVID pandemic helped kick this into place. The World Economic Forum and the United Nations entered into a strategic partnership in 2019 for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This agreement shows an increased privatization of global power as it coalesces into fewer hands. Consolidation of global power is expanding with a shift towards a flatter economy with unified governance. For the United States to remain a world player, it will follow the route of other nations and forfeit some of its independence. Privacy no longer exists as we once knew it. Technology has a memory. Our email transactions are recorded en masse. Internet browsing is monitored. Smartphones track and record the location and movement of their owners. Massive archives exist for our phone calls, instant messages, and interactive website posts. Large institutions fight over who has the right to own and use metadata of web users. Medical records have been sold or hacked for tens of millions of people at a time, repeatedly. Financial records have also fallen prey by the millions. It's not just traffic and surveillance camps that have people concerned about privacy. There is a growing concern about the invisible tracking methods of high-tech institutions. Self-determination versus technology dependence has become a trade-off. Title 47 of the United States Code, Section 30, allows private companies to restrict any speech of their choosing. Web hosts and providers of interactive computer services, like social networks, are permitted to censor content. This can and has meant censoring opinions as well. People have been suspended or banned from interactive networks for their point of view. Contentious disputes about national election fraud are still ongoing, though not highly publicized. It's possible that the next national election will be fraught with similar disputes. This could fuel unease among an already polarized nation. Artificial intelligence allows machines to make decisions based on their environment. This is seen in self-driving cars, interactive control programs such as Siri and Alexa, and locating people with facial recognition technology. It also allows search engines to deliver pre-edited selective responses that are programmed into its algorithms. Some now ask if new technologies are expanding our reach or limiting our choices. Transhumanism calls for the enhancement of human beings with technology. Technologies would be designed to augment sensory perception, emotional response, or mental capacity. They would also seek to improve health, supplement strengths, and increase longevity. Modifications would integrate biological or physical technologies into the human body. 
Neuralink brain implants are already in development and could go into clinical trial this year. Public opinion is mixed on this, and some fear that it amounts to playing God. The fourth industrial revolution is upon us, and some of us are feeling the changes in our lives, some more so than others, but that is changing. As science fiction author William Gibson said, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. As policies and corporate practices follow, we will all feel the changes, because we will be living them. Americans have passively accepted and even embraced these shifts from the machine age to the technology era. But a group of people will follow a road for only so long before stopping to get its bearings. This stop is due to come as we suddenly emerge from inactivity and burst into action. As we do that, we will be in an emotional state of agitation. That's because of the double crossovers in the cycles of change of America. When you add all that up, one possible outcome is a revolt against a techno-political state, a grassroots uprising with active outrage. Whatever happens, a bump in the road lies just before us because it is due. The events described here are not the only possible sparks that could set off the disturbance. The upheavals we face could take place over other matters. It could be even over sudden contemporaneous issues that have nothing to do with the techno-political state as was supposed here. But whatever the issues, we are evidently destined for the crises of 2027. So this is a quick walk of the triad of rhythms in America. If there's one message to impart in this, it would be to look at what the cycles are, how history bears them out, and plot them to see where our course will take us in the future. Okay, it's a little video presentation on the idea that nations have internal rhythms that start at the time that the nation begins. These internal rhythms move like clockwork through time, regardless of what's happening at the time in the nation, what's happening in world events. And with that, since there's a time in the cycle when crisis is encoded, it's interesting how the mathematics works out that once in a while, you will have two cycles reach a point of crisis at the same time. And since the last three times that occurred were pretty significant, I wanted to focus this talk on the next time we have just before us when the mathematics and durations of these periodic cycles would have two cycles reach that same point again. So if there's any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, this is uh, a unique theory on how we move the internal. This is not just based on fundamental analysis of data. This is taking a look at the abstract principles that are involved, encoded in our, our being. So I thank you for watching the video and for listening. And it's something to note and to perhaps preserve until 2027 arrives and we find out what happens. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, uh, for a follow up uh, insightful uh, share on what to expect for the cycles ahead in 2027. And one of the questions, uh, uh, if I may kind of open up with, is this idea of a crisis opportunity. So you mentioned grassroot wave. What, what yes. could that look like? And, 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 and what could be the crisis opportunity of that wave? When you look back on the Watergate affair, which was a crossover of the emotional cycle and the intellectual cycle, you had a very popular, hard, hard feeling. How could they be doing this? Because that was emotional agitation. And what were they agitated about? A conceptual idea of what politicians were doing. They weren't yelling about industrial recession, that's physical. It was outrage over an idea. How do they think they can get away with this? Who do they think we are that they're making fools of the public? So it is the mind and the heart in agitation. Well, 
This time, we're going to have an emotional crossover, an emotional agitation again, but it's not going to be combined with an intellectual crossover. It's going to be combined with a physical crossover. The physical cycle is the cycle of action. We have been sort of dormant. This has been a dark night for America in a way that we've been passive um, and there's a bit of indolence. There's, we're accepting everything. People are likely to spontaneously come out and demand whatever it is that's on their mind and they're gonna be very aggressive. So how will it play out? Will there be rioting in the streets? Don't know, but it's a possibility. Uh, we have a, a question just now from Peter G uh, on where are we now? So your prediction is for 2027, but here in 2022, where do you see us now? Low, low, wait a minute. I got this other one. Ah. Low, this is a <laughs> low. Everything is low in America. You see what happens, you get the confluence of cycles work when sometimes some are high, some are low. Uh, sometimes you will have them all high, the roaring 20s. We had the majority of them high in the 60s. But every now and then, you're going to have a time when they're all down. And we're in that time right now. Um, 2020 was a real bottom for the physical cycle following the 2018 bottom of the emotional cycle. With or without COVID, we were destined to have a recession in 2020. And then COVID made it much, much worse. But now we are rising. And in 2027, two of the low cycles are going to cross the midpoint of crisis and break into the high half simultaneously. Well, the 2030s are going to be a great time for the sciences. It's going to be uptime again. It's going to be, yay, but the dark night is going to end with a mighty hard alarm clock, 2027. Thank you. And, and one of the questions that often come up traditionally from uh, first time cycle enthusiasts um, is this point about fate and free will. I'm sure you, you've maybe debated that out so many times over the years, like, like many of us. Um, uh, in this work, what's your take, uh, particularly with the predictive nature of, of what you've just shared with us and, and th those big questions that people might be asking? Thank you for that question. I think it's both determination versus free will, classic question, absolutely love it. You, we have both because our internal rhythms are within us, yet we still have the freedom of cho to choose that will never be taken away from us. Uh, you may have a down day, but that doesn't stop you from going out for a walk if you so choose. So yeah, we're not blind. We're not going to follow uh, as if we couldn't make decisions. But how are we when we go to make those conditions? Like, for instance, if we decide it's morally right to go to war because we were attacked in 1941 or because we're defending ourselves and we have to. Well, let me tell you something. We were in a low in 1941. I mean, we were still in the Great Depression when all three cycles were low. It's the last time that all three cycles were low was during the Great Depression. But I don't care where your cycles are. If somebody attacks you, that adrenaline's going to kick in. And so, yeah, you're going to decide to go to war. You're going to go to war and you're going to do what you have to do. Um, it's a bit vague for me to answer it this way, but I wish to say it's both. One is not mutually exclusive of the other. They, they do influence each other. Well, I mean, the one influences the other, excuse me. Very good. And, and I mean, for many of the people who, who are attending today, it's, it's a very much global, diverse uh, demographic. Uh, what does your work say about other countries in the world and, and how their cycles might influence? It's very interesting. Um, as I mentioned in the video, I believe that every cycle, I mean, every nation has cycles of the same durations. They're all born with a 28 year physical, 36 year emotional and um, 44 year intellectual. And so how does that play when you have cycles doing trade? Well, you look at the interactions between Japan and the United States, it appears that when our physical cycle was high, theirs was low and vice versa. So that when we started to decline after 1985, with the downward crossover uh, of the, physical cycle then, 
And we were declining, but Japan was rising. So what were they doing? They come over by Rockefeller Center and they start importing more cars. They outproduce us just in time technology that we didn't develop. They were rising, they were falling. But then, you know, somewhere in the 1990s, we started to rise a little bit and they were coming down. Why? Because they were born at a different time. So if their cycles start on this date, our start at that date, and they're always going to be as they are. And this is sometimes very interesting if you want to trade currencies. You know, if you're going to do it on the long term, not arbitrage, but um, you can trade into a rise and so forth, swapping your currencies that way on who's rising and who's falling. We have a, a double uh, question of, of, of uh, variations from uh, a member, Jeff H. Uh, first part is do you have? an idea, and I know you touched on this, David, uh, in terms of the drive, well, the, the nature of the three cycles. And I think the question here is on the driver of these cycles. Did you, do you have any philosophical thoughts on that? I do have an answer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I simply do not know. And <laughs> I've only observed this. I see this. Um, and Back in 1978, the first thing that hit me, which was, to me, it was an epiphany, didn't start with the thought of cycles. It started with the idea that the pattern of everything is in anything. And how delighted I was to find out that that was a very unoriginal thought. You look at the Sufi masters and Tat Vamasi, I am that, the macrocosm is the microcosm. We can go on forever. There's cycles people here. Many of these things are known. So it's a holographic fractal universe, yes. But uh, the next thing that hit me on that was uh, how on long term, a nation sort of behaves like a person. And things that we can observe about our lives, you know, for instance, it started out, I heard that uh, other countries would, people in other countries would some say that the United States is a young nation and that we would go into Europe and, well, we think we could just put money down and buy things and some people with old traditions might be a little insulted or they feel that they're not being recognized for the depth and the rich that of uh, the culture that comes over age and everything like that. Don't get me wrong, I love my country, but this is behavior and young. What's the difference between a young country and an old country? A country ages. And so that was the first thing to go through this phylogenic development of a nation being parallel to a person. And the next thing after that was to realize it has a mind, heart, and body, and they move in rhythm. So that was the bridge that connected me from the beginning. Thank you uh, for, for the, the first uh, honest <laughs> and, and, and often uh, important point about the mystery of cycles, uh, yes. followed by the context of, of, of how your work was, was shaped um, and, and how it influences. Uh, Jeff then followed up with uh, the point of crossovers. Uh, what happens at peaks and troughs? So you mentioned the low, low, low that we're in right now. Um, what caused you to focus on crossovers in the first place? So maybe a, a take on peaks and troughs and, and what actually triggered your search in that direction? Let's go back to the 60s. Some of us are old enough to remember it. So you better show some respect. <laughs> and oh, you're too young for that. You know? You're too good looking to be remembering the 60s. But um, <laughs> back in the 1960s in America, it was a peak of the emotional and intellectual cycles. And at that time, there was an explosion of emotional intellectual energy, the pop art, the hippie movement, the mod era, the intellectualism. We elected an intellectual from Massachusetts for the presidency, John F. Kennedy, the uh, fad of psychology. Oh my goodness. And it was all just exploding during that time because the cycles peaked then. And after the peak is actually more productive than the peak because that's the second quarter as you bring things to fruition and branch out. So that's an example of how it can be uh, when cycles peak. And as I mentioned in the 20s, you know, you had a decade where everything peaked. Then uh, in the, after 1985 and going into the early 90s, it was all low. Uh, we hit a low. Uh, in the emotional cycle in 1982, which was a market bottom. We hit a low in the intellectual cycle in 1984, and that was a market bottom. And the th things sort of stand still. 
whether the, you go to the top or you go to the bottom, it's like throwing a ball up into the air. It goes up and up, slows down until eventually stops. And then it begins to fall and gains momentum again. Well, when that cycle hits the bottom, you're going to have recessions. Like when the physical cycle hit the bottom in 1992, industrial recession, one of the things that caused the election for incumbent President George Bush. Um, so, um, but highs are just outpouring of energies and lows are a time of declining and stillness. Now, why did I focus on crossovers? Because when I had to do a massive amount of research into American history to corroborate that these theories of cycles were true. And, you know, if the cycle's here, then this should be happening. If it's there, that should happen. And in the, and in the process of doing that, I was finding when we would have our industrial recessions, we would have our riots, we would have our disturbances, our controversial court decisions and whatnot. And uh, they were coinciding when the cycle crossed high and the cycle crossed low. So it was more a matter of discovery. A follow-up question on cause and effect, uh, uh, but more in terms of the, the uh, mechanistic or, or scientific uh, potential factors uh, from, from Bachi. How does the solar cycles, EM, EMF, vitamin D, have any input into your cyclical understandings of emotional intelligence? You know, um, <laughs> I love talking to Ray Tomes because of his great knowledge of this uh, on, on solar cycles and everything. Um, not that he is a proponent of this social theory, but because of his work on solar cycles. But commonly known is the 11, 11 11.2 year cycle uh, in the sun and 22 year cycle uh, as a minor. Well, when you look at the 44 year intellectual cycle, that's four times 11. And so it may very well be that there are elements that, um, you know, in the natural bodies around us that are influencing the durations as they evolve. When you look at the 36 year emotional cycle and compare it to the nearly 18 year, 18.2 year Sero cycles of the moon. Now here we have possibly the moon uh, cycles influencing the durations of emotional cycles in the nation. Here we have the sun possibly influencing uh, as a multiple, uh, the intellectual cycle. Now the, the brain is electrical and uh, it may be influenced by that and so forth. So possibly there's a connection there. I find it is an interesting correlation. I've not been able to satisfactorily draw a connect link but I am. I do wish to mention that correlation so that maybe somebody can make that connection. Great. So suffice to say, correlation, but perhaps not uh, fully uh, causation uh, in, in in the research that you've done. That's the way I see it. Yes. Okay. And then we just have some uh, uh, final questions, more on the market side and and the impact of your cycle work um, in that domain. Uh, so I can. I believe uh, Peter G is asking the question, how would you use this for the stock market? The stock market is how I was originally able to pinpoint the date of these cycles as beginning in March 21, 1775. I had an idea of what these cycles were for various reasons. I came up with the durations. I sort of understood what the nature of them were, but I had to say, well, when does the United States begin? Well, we tend to celebrate the beginning of the United States as July 4th, 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was signed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's not when the country began. Because the country had to already exist before it said it existed. Because if it didn't already exist, it couldn't say that. Uh, so what I started to do, I wanted to use the stock market as a way, that's a great way to monitor human behavior with great statistics and great accuracy because there are records kept every day. So I actually went to the library every day and I started recording with pencils in charts, the uh, every one of the Dow Jones industrial closing prices, uh, the advanced decline line. I was recording advances versus decline. I was advanced recording new highs versus new lows. Then I studied the Granville method and I was doing 10 day, 20 day moving averages with a lot of these and all of that. I was even looking at Barron's and Wall Street quotes as a reverse barometer. And um, so on and on, and this was a massive amount of work and I had charts upon charts. And then over, over, I would overlay where the charts of America would be. And I was making a composite chart of when you put them all together. And I looked at it every day and I found 
every day it was wrong <laughs> because I started. <laughs> so, so what I did, because I used this clear cellophane and I was drawing this, this is early eighties now, this is like 1980. And then I said, well, what if I move these economic data charts and move the cellophane overlay of my cycles chart until they look like they fit? And you know what happened? I found a fit consistent through time. And to do that, I had to move the econ I had to move the starting date of my cycles back from July 4th, 1776 to March 21, 1775. The following month is when the fighting broke out between the revolutionaries uh, in America in Concord and Lexington, uh, Massachusetts against the British, the shot that was heard around the world. And by the end of 1775, we were alive and well. We had a Continental Congress. We had our own Navy. We had an army headed by George Washington. We had our own conscript to, play, to pay the army. Uh, and we even had our own flag with the red and white stripes and the cross of St. George up in the Canton, which was later replaced by stars. Thank you, Betsy. So um, now, uh, but how, what does that mean today? Yes, you can do this. On macroeconomics, there is absolutely, I'll stand by this, a correlation between stock market motion and where these cycles are. But if you're an arbitrage dealer, remember these are cycles of so many years, but yes, they correlate. Um, and, and just a, a wrap up, a market question on on the impact of these cycles, uh, more specific, I mean, specific on the US, but more specifically on the context of the US dollar. There's a question from uh, Agnes S. When the US is at the lows, lows, lows now, why is the US dollar at an all time high against most currencies? I don't know. I'll have to research that. And, and, and on that, that uh, ongoing encouragement for research <laughs> um, on behalf of the foundation of the study of cycles and the research of cycles. Thank you very much, uh, David, for a fantastic presentation. Following on from your presentation in 2021, I uh, included that link on, on, on the chat for, the, for people to review thereafter. It's on our YouTube uh, channel. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Um, and just to uh, close uh, our preview of uh, our day two on Thursday, uh, we have our uh, head of uh, uh, Foundation Study of Cycles uh, in Science and Nature, Ray Tomes, who's with us online now, uh, speaking about the 207-year uh, solar cycle. Um, I've read the preview paper to this, and, and I'm very excited to uh, uh, actually attend the presentation. Um, so please tune in for that on Thursday, our opening presentation. Um, a follow-up will be from myself, uh, just a brief educational overview on the history of cycles and key influencers with a, a highlight on uh, markets and, and solar cycles. Um, and then just finally, um, as is traditional, um, uh, a fireside chat with our FSC uh, chairman, Dr. Uh, Richard Smith, will be reviewing key objectives for the year ahead. I've, I've mentioned them already at the start of this session and we'll review them in more depth uh, this coming Thursday. So thank you everyone. Uh, for tuning in, uh, record attendance, and, and really excited to, to see the level of awareness of cycles increasing from high to high. We look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Mm -hmm.